This is uh, my family. Uh, I'm sure you've met them. The whining girl. <laughs> that is uh, Sophie. And then uh, Faith. That's a spelling of uh, my name, to be here. To be here means let's declare uh, things, not people. Okay? <laughs> We've been married nine years, uh, with two daughters. I know I don't look that old. Uh, it's been nine beautiful years. Uh, I'm really grateful to God for that time that we spent together. Um, if you'll be with us this afternoon, I can share with you how we met. It's another story uh, by itself. Uh, today, I want to talk to us about investing in people, uh, the contrast between the permanent and the temporal, investing in people. Before we do that, I would like us to pray together, then uh, we can get started. So, let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this morning, yet another beautiful day. You have given us a chance to live, you given us breath, you have given our hearts heartbeat. We don't take that for granted. We ask that, Lord, that we should be looking up this morning, be true of us in actions, be true of us in our thoughts. We want to pray for people out there, people here. The Lord may that be our focus. Because uh, among many things, Lord, you thought of us. Pleasing the Father, honoring who God is. Father, you sent your son, your son of faith, dying on your cross. Father, I pray for you. In the same way, we focus on people, focus on the souls of men. Because they are one of the human Pray Jesus Amen. Amen. I'll tell you a story, fish story. Most of you must have read this. It's not my story. Someone wrote this story. But I found it interesting. Someone read for me this story some years ago. And I, I'm always reminded of important things when I read this story. It's a very hard story to understand. Uh, it's, uh, what's the word? It's, uh, um, what's the word? Now, you know my English is also very limited, okay? But uh, it, it's thought of, what's the word, Grace? It's, uh, yeah, it's, like it's, like it's like a parable. It's like a parable, yes. Beautiful. It says, now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. How many of you have heard that story? One. Anyone else? Two. Okay. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around them. This is a group of people who existed. They call themselves what? Fishermen. And there were fish all around them. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams of lakes filled with fish. And the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, and year after year, these who called themselves fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish. The abundance of fish and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully define what fishing means. They defended fishing as an occupation and call and, uh, and declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of fishermen. Continually, they search for new and better methods of fishing and for new and better definitions of fishing. Further, they say, the fishing industry exists by fishing as fire exists by burning. They love slogans such as fishing is a task of every fisherman. Every fisherman is a fisher and the fisherman's outpost, outpost for every fisherman's club. These fishermen, they built large and beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. One thing they did do, however, they did fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized the board to send out fishermen to other places where there were many fish. All the fishermen agreed. They seemed to agree that what is needed is a board that could challenge fishermen to be faithful in fishing. The board was formed by those who had the great vision and courage to speak about fishing, to define fishing, to promote the idea of fishing in foul streams and lakes 
where many fish and other fish of different colors live. Also, the board hired staffs and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, to defend fishing, to decide what new streams be thought about. But the staff and committee members did not fish. Large and elaborate and expensive training centers were built whose original and primary purpose was to teach fishermen how to fish. Over the years, courses were offered on the needs of fish, the nature of fish, where to find fish, the psychological reaction of fish, how to approach fish and feed fish. Those who taught, they had doctorates in physiology, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught fishing. Year after year, after tedious training, many were graduated and were given fishing licenses. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some to distant waters that were filled with fish. Some spent much study and trouble to learn the history of fishing and to see faraway places where the founding fathers did great fishing for the centuries past. They lauded the faithful fishermen of years before who handed down the idea of fishing. Many who felt the call to be fishermen responded. They were commissioned and sent out to fish. But like the fishermen back home, they never fished. Like the fishermen back home, they engaged in all kinds of other occupations. They built power plants to pump water for fish and tractors to plow new waterways. They made all kinds of equipment to travel here and there to look at fish hatcheries. Some also say that they wanted to be part of the fishing party, but they felt called to furnish fishing equipment. Others felt that their job was to relate to fish in a good way so that the fish would know the difference between good and bad fishing. Others felt that simply letting the fish know that they were nice, land-loving neighbors and how loving and kind they thought that was enough. After one starring meeting on the necessity of fishing, one young fella left the meeting and he went fishing. The next day, he reported that he had caught two outstanding fish. He was honored for his excellent catch and was scheduled to start visiting the big meetings possible to tell how he did it. So he quit fishing in order to have time to tell about the experience to the other fishermen. How? Say, he was also placed on the fisherman's general board as a person having considerable experience. Now, it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and they put up with many kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day. They received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs. And the fact that they claimed to be fishermen yet never fished. They wondered about those who felt it was of little use to attend the weekly meetings to talk about fishing. After all, were they not following the master who said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men? Imagine how hot somewhere when one day a person suggested that those who didn't catch fish were not real fishermen, no matter how much they claimed to be. Yet it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year he never catches the fish? Those who didn't catch fish were really not fishermen. And no matter how much they claim to be, the question is, is a person a fisherman if year after year he never catches the fish? Now, I met a fisherman the other day. Thursday, and I've had several <coughs> philosophies about fishing. You guys use the hook, the leisure kind of fishing. And uh, the guy says, it doesn't matter whether you catch the fish or not, it's the time you spend waiting for that, for the fish. But when you call yourself a fisherman, if you don't catch any, any fish. The master says in Matthew 4, 19, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I need to use Peter. Peter, please come. He's the only one of me of me here. I want to show about the other. The first time we came and met your pastor, Peter was just coming through the door. 
and you are trying to illustrate for us here something. It's not the same thing. <laughs> okay, it's not the same thing. Who am I? Maybe. That's a good answer. That's not what I'm looking for. Who am I? Pardon? This is who? Who is this? This is Peter. This is Peter, okay? And who am I? No, no, no. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. This is Peter. Who am I? Jesus, Jesus! I know it's hard to believe Jesus was black, but you know, <laughs> hard to believe. But I'm Jesus at this point, okay? And I'm telling Peter, follow me and I'll make you fisher. The fisher of what? For men. It was Peter and three others. I'm walking. Follow me and I'll make you the fisher of what? For men. Is Peter following? So far. So far, he's following, okay? Not too close. Not too close, but he's following, isn't it? And Christ says, he said it once. I don't think he said it once. I'm not too sure about that, okay? But he calls and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Peter and his friends, okay? And the Bible says they dropped their nets and immediately did what? And they follow me. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What am I doing? I'm fishing. I'm fishing, isn't it? What am I fishing? Amen. I'm fishing? Man, what is Peter supposed to be doing? <laughs> what is he supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be fishing? Man, he's a professional fisher of fish. He knows the technique of fishing one. Fish. But the master is saying, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of what? Amen. The whole time Peter was following me, <laughs> and I'm fishing, and he's not. The question is, is he actually following the master? Because for as long as he's following the master, he is going to be fishing what? Man, thank you so much. <laughs> for as long as he's following the master, he's going to be fishing man. And the question that we have there is, is one, Following. If he's not fishing, he's not following. If he's not fishing, I've got a picture of fishermen here. I don't know if they are actually fishermen. They're wearing camouflage, <laughs> like soldiers or something. Just pick this from the internet. Someone painted it this way, and they say fishermen, not fishers of men, fishermen. Okay. When they catch the fish from out of the water, the fish is alive when it's inside the water, isn't it? But when they bring it onto the boat, what happens? The fish does what? It dies. It needs to gasp for air. And eventually the fish does what? It dies. But the fishers of men are surrounded by dead fish. And when they catch the fish from out of the water and they bring the fish onto the boat, what happens? The fish becomes alive. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture? That the fishermen catching fish and it's dying. The fishers of men are catching the fish and the fish is coming what? Back to life. The fish is coming back to life. He put it very clearly in Ephesians chapter 2. For you were once dead in your trespasses. You were once dead in your trespasses. But he made us alive in who? In Christ Jesus. And the death that he talks about is not a coma. It's not not feeling well. It's dead. Dead. Completely dead. I was reading a book. This guy who keeps doing uh, deep books. What's his name? Wisdom. Warren Wisdom. He did one of the Ephesians. And there is a chapter where he says, he says, get out of the graveyard. That's it. Move away from the grave. Just move away from the graveyard. All right, you are dead. He made your life. Move on from the graveyard. Move away from the graveyard. You can't be still saying, oh, I was once dead. Now I'm alive. And you're still hanging like you're dead. He said, he said, move away from the graveyard. Move on. There's so much life ahead of us in Christ Jesus. But we were dead. And he made us alive. We're in a world of dead fish. 
Feuerwand. Some, this is what some goes. May have died today, and you can't smell them. Some may have been dead a month, and they're still dead. But they're dead. They're dead. Dead. And a dead person, you can't feed them. You will shake them, they won't respond. They will not respond. And we have no power in ourselves to spiritually make someone alive. We don't. We only bear the message that does. We only bear the message that does. This is so profound. When you look at life that way, in Christ, dead or alive, that Peter may not have been the first one to refer to it that way. Christ himself did, in using the word born again. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, our passage today, 1 Peter chapter 1, if you can open there, 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 3, Peter uses the same word again. Born again. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, According to his great mercy, what has he done? He has called us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's who we are in Christ. Born again to a living hope. Someone said in Indiana, is it Indiana? I think it's in Indiana. Yeah, there's so many philosophies here. But someone said in Indiana, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. <laughs> That's true, is that true? Okay? But I also understand you guys keep watching the weather like it's news or something. When you have a party, what's the weather going to be like? Oh, in the afternoon, you'll go up to 90 and just here. You can't like that. Because for us, it's wet and dry. Either way, you will leave. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a wet or dry. But the hope we're talking about is not, oh, I hope it will shine tomorrow. In as much as you look at the weather and you say it won't shine right? tomorrow. Because that hope is dead. Because tomorrow, it can rain. It can rain. And as much as your app is telling you it will shine tomorrow, it can rain tomorrow. And as much as your app is telling you it's going to cool out, it can become hotter today. Because they only predict, it's estimated to be 70%. What is the word they use? Probably what? Percentage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning the other 30%, it could do what? It may not. It may, it may not. That hope is not alive. The hope, I hope, I hope it will, that's not the way we throw it around. The hope he's talking about is living hope in Christ Jesus. That every day we know for sure that how Christ lives, the God that we serve, our Savior, is alive. He's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. Amen. When he came out of the grave, he appeared to several people. A lie. That even Thomas could say, I will not believe until I touch. At the same time, he appeared and said, Here you go. Now, blessed are they who will believe without even seeing. Right. That is a lie. We cannot take it for granted. We cannot take it for granted. But you imagine how many people have built their house on sinking sand. They built their house on sinking They build their house on sinking sand. In as much as history repeats itself, for some reason they believe they live here forever. For some reason. They live their life thinking, I'm going to be on earth forever. They've watched others die, but for some reason 
They fail to understand that this is temporal. It's not forever. You can imagine how lost one can get and dead. In fact, another, other passage of scripture refer to as blinded. Blinded means someone is blinding your eyes and it's actually blinding you. It's an action that we cannot take for granted. But he begins the passage and says, Blessed be the God, that God is the anchor point. I've done some graphics, and the rotating objects in Photoshop, is what they call define the anchor point. And you can move it from the middle, you can move it anywhere. But as long as you move that object, this remains the what? Remains the center. But the context of First Peter is to believers that are scattered. Okay? They're suffering. And Peter begins by saying, not the first words, but after the greeting, he's saying, Blessed be the God. And far now, you imagine you've had the worst of days, okay? And I want to pick this from our, our coach's name right there. Use this illustration. I don't know what the worst of days could be for you. And I keep saying, I think Job had one of those days. But Job in the Bible, in the scriptures, he had, I think, the worst of days. I mean, you're one of the rich guys, richest. Have everything with you. I mean, the guys literally owned cattle and humans. He had the children. He loved God. He loved God. The man sacrificed just in case one of his children and damaged had sinned. He loved God. He loved the fellowship with God. But one day, he's there, and the servant runs to him and says, all your cattle are gone. And as he's still talking, that was a very good strategy. Okay, not good, good, but it's one of those strategies I think the, the, the enemy uses. That you always need something to tell the story. Okay, when, when, when the emperors went conquering, they always leave something, they leave, always leave one person to tell the story of what happened. But they left one servant to go and tell the story. You go tell him what has just happened here. He says, everything you have now, all your children are gone. Before the guy could finish, another one comes and tells him what, is, what has just happened. Before he's done, someone else brings more bad news, more bad, one piece after another. And the same day, Job is looking at 10 graves of his children. Imagine you having a day as bad as Job. And someone comes and says, Praise the Lord! You'll be thinking, What are you praising? You do not know what's happening. Peter is telling these people who are suffering, praise, blessed be the God, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, amidst our suffering, really. But also imagine you've had a very bad day. Nothing can compare to the loss of someone. But let's say someone tells you, oh, your house, there was a gas leak. I keep getting out in the movies, I don't know what that means. But there was a gas leak. And everything you have is burnt up. I said, yeah, the house is insurance. It's, it's insured. Well, we don't have insurance back home for such things. But someone tells you, everything that you have is gone. But you have a billion dollars. That sounds like it's gone, but there is this. Blessed be the God, and he describes what we have in Christ. Because what we have in Christ is more than what you believe. What we have in Christ is more than what you want. And we're really despairing that. But God is the anchor point. Everything doesn't make sense. Now, I've had very... <coughs> people who have had several philosophies from scripture. Uh, I've been a missionary for a long time. Not compared to some, more of some 40 years. But 10 years is not, is not bad. But one thing I've been taught all through ministry is God first, and your family, and your family. But recently, and then ministry, but recently I heard someone put it this way. And I know Grace keeps telling faith, each time faith, sometimes faith <coughs> can come and say, between God and the devil, who is stronger? And you say, you cannot start to compare. <laughs> you can't start comparing God to God. <coughs> the devil, it's not, it's not a matter of white and black. <coughs> 
It's not a matter of good and evil, which one is stronger. You cannot start comparing God to anything. And, and I agree. I agree. But someone put it this way in relation to things and priorities. And he says, we cannot compare, say, God first, number two, and then number three. Because you're beginning to compare. Now, again, each is right. I don't know how that sounds. It sounds like relativity, but it's not. Depending on what they're thinking about, it makes sense. Okay? And this is what they say. It says God is at the center, and everything else revolves around him. Your family revolves around him. Your ministry revolves around him. When your money revolves around him, when you look at every aspect of your life in relation to God and everything revolving around him, you'll understand exactly where God falls in the matter of priorities. That even as we are giving this morning, God is the center of everything. Whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. That is at the center. Blessed be the God. Nothing else will make sense. We're talking about investing in people. You will not see people the way people are ought to be looked at unless you look at them the way God looks at them. Unless you look at them the way God looks at them. Now, the story I forgot to share with you earlier on. Now, I've had an awesome time. This is my first time in the US, in the US, United States of America. You guys are well advertised, okay? You're well advertised by the media. <coughs> Most of the things they say about the US is true. Okay? Very organized. You have very good drivers. I mean, <laughs> you don't want to drive in Uganda. You don't want to drive in Uganda. Everything is, it's, it's awesome. Before that, Trump is real. <laughs> Everything is, is your well advertised. I've had an awesome time. When I came, I started taking coffee. Because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be jet lagged and miss hours of this experience. I have a very short time here. Soon we'll be traveling back home. And I want to enjoy every single bit of it. I told people I'm going and I'm going to drive from Indiana, I mean from Schoolnet to Indiana. I said, What? You cannot drive? I said, I will drive. I will. We will go. I had to learn to on the wrong side of the road, learn all the rules, <laughs> and we came. Very excited. But when we arrived in Schoolnet, I met a friend who likes to run. His name is Eric. And I was tired. I'm taking coffee one cup after another just to keep up in the meetings. I, meetings were very awesome. I didn't want to miss any beat, any second. And I want to go jogging in the morning because I've met a friend who loves to do it. The night before that, we were playing soccer with the Bible Institute students until almost like midnight. There were all these floodlights that you can play. And we were playing soccer, I went to sleep, 5 a.m. I'm up, going to run. I don't want to miss any bit of this. I want to enjoy everything. Everything was surprising. I mean, indoor swimming pool with warm water. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> but the best part of the trip for me so far was when I met this couple for the first time. When my dad passed away, I shared this with you earlier. When my dad passed away when I was 10, my mom registered me with Compassion International. And Compassion started paying my school fees in the time of a child. Finished high school, and the couple that was sponsoring me could not do it anymore because college is more expensive. And so this other couple takes me to support me through my university. That's so I got to get a bachelor's degree in IT. And they gave me this computer two years ago as a gift. That was high school, finished high school, three years of university. They're sponsoring me, finished high school, I mean finished university, joined World of Life, and they were my first supporters in ministry. First supporters in ministry. One would think we've taken you through university, go make your own money. Okay? But the first supporters in ministry, they are God. And I told them, I'm coming to America, to your continent. I'd like to see you. I said, where? Screw Lake. I know USA is a very big country, but I'd like to see you. And somehow they said, we would like to see you too. And then Indiana. So I think it's 30 minutes from here. Let's find that out. And we drive there, the first place we went to, driving, just following a woman 
with her voices, turn left, turn right. <laughs> the GPS at some point she was telling us to turn right and we're right above the road. How she thinks we should just drive over to the <laughs> you have to make a turn. But we arrived at some point we got lost because we're following the GPS and the bridge is out. And completely out, I say road closed, road closed, say keep driving, for my and I say the road is closed, the road is closed. But somehow we found our way. We arrived at their house, I'd seen the house on Google Maps, thank God for IT. I knew how the house looks like. I said, Grace, this is the house. This is the house. I said, no, David. I said, this is the house. So I just drove in. And they come out. There were those cute dogs. They come out to meet us. And I could not believe I'm looking at the couple for the first time. That has invested so much, more than 10 years of their life, into my life. I just could not believe. For a while, they are talking, and I can't hear what they are saying. Blah, 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 blah. I just cannot believe. I had never seen them for more than 10 years. We are exchanging emails. Each time I ask, could you please send me a picture? <coughs> they are not replying those emails. They reply every other email apart from the one who sent us a picture. I've sent them my wedding pictures. I've sent them first born, second born. They knew everything about me, but I've never met them. We lived with them for four days, and the day came to say bye. That was the hardest day. That was the hardest day. We didn't want to go. We didn't want to go. And I told him, you have a very special place in my heart. I don't always say that in my emails, but I told them, I got to just tell them face to face. Now, the guy is 90 years old. 90 years. He almost cannot go properly. That means he stole an elevator in his house. So he doesn't end up in the home. And he's walking slowly, he's walking slowly, walking towards the car to say bye to us. And he stops, he gives me a hug, and I'm almost sure I will never see this guy again. I just go to see him again this past Thursday, thank God. But he leans over, he gives me a hug, and he says, David, go win souls for Christ. Amen. Go win souls for Christ. The summary of all his life. If those were his last words, he's simply saying, go in souls for Christ. I could see it in his eyes. I could see it in his, I could hear it in his voice. Very beautiful words. Go in souls for Christ. That was the best part of my dream. I will never forget those words. I will never forget those words. I may never see them again. I will never forget them. I don't know how much time he has here or not. I may never see him again, but those are very beautiful words. David, go in soul to Christ. Someone once said, only two things will last forever. The word of God, the souls of men. Everything else, the nations, and no will, the tribes made, the old tribes, but all those are surrounding men. He loves people, so should He loves people, so should Let me show you something from First Peter here. Something we may, may miss. When you look at those passages, <coughs> the ones we just read, the description given of what we have in Christ is just awesome. It's just awesome. But we can't forget that God is the answer. If you remember very carefully, most of the major conditions we have in Scripture have God right at the center. In John 15, Christ is an analogy of the farmer and the gardener. And he says, abide in me and you bear fruit. And I believe at that point, it's time to be corrected, that fruit has been used in relation to people in the, in the context of John. In Galatians, fruit of the Spirit may not be people, but fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, generous, and self control. But I want to believe when it talks about more application, bear fruit, fruit that will last is in reference to people. That you will not plow, bear more fruit, and fruit that will do it, and will last. But when you look at that passage at first glance, you may be tempted to think that the command is to go bear fruit. But the command is to do it, to abide. Abide in me, and you will do it. Is their fruit. God at the center. Abiding means, means 
relationship with me first. All authority on earth has been given to who? To me, Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all earth, of all nations, starting with who? With Christ. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will do what? You will receive power. You will be my witnesses in what? In Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Oh, yeah. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. Starting with God. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, you do. Peter, do you love me? Remember, I told him. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Christ is out of the picture. Expecting Peter to continue following and fishing. What does Peter do? He goes back fishing. And he brings everyone else. Guys, yeah, let's go, let's go. Come on, let's go fishing, fish. The life we live, we must live again. And they see someone walking on water. Say, that must be the master. How are they reminded? By a miracle, they remember. Throw your nets where? On the other side. They catch so much fish. That they remember, they say, that can only be attributed to who? To the master. He makes breakfast for them at the seashore and reminds them of the most important thing. And he asks the question, I personally believe it was referring to the fish. Do you love me more than these? Really? Do you love me more than these? You've caught so much fish. Do you love me more than these? Still him being the anchor point, what does he say? Feed my what? Feed my sheep. Who we are in Christ is because of his mercy. He says that in that passage. Because of his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And we praise him for that. What we have in Christ is permanent. It's not temporal. It is not temporal. But sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes you don't feel like it. I'll ask you something else here. I borrowed this from Steve J. Cole in his article, Saved Unto Eternity. And he says in 1 Peter, these Christians are suffering. And he notes in chapter 2, 11, 18 to 20, he says, these Christian slaves were being treated unfairly by their masters. These are the recipients of excuse me, 1 Peter. You know that had done, done nothing wrong. He's writing to them and he's telling them, blessed be the God. What you have in Christ is important. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's permanent. But these were suffering. They were suffering people. They were hurting. The Christian wives in chapter 3, they were being missed by their unbelieving husbands. They were suffering people. They were suffering people. In chapter 2, 12, 3, 16, many of the believers had lost former friends who were now slandering them. They were suffering people. They were suffering people. Something else here. He says, some are being threatened. And it's likely that some even were facing one of them. They were suffering Christians. Peter knew all of these problems, and yet he proclaimed to them, blessed be the God. Who has caused us to be born again to a living hope? And each of the things I've described, when people suffer, usually, most of the cases, it's because people are hurting people. I mean, when I got beat by a dog, I'm suffering, okay? It's not as painful. When I get beat by another human being, it's personal. That is personal. It's more personal when it's another human being. An accident, I, I tripped, I fell, it may hurt, I actually break my leg. In the press, oh, what happened? I was running, then I broke my That may not be as painful as someone else breaking my leg. That is different. The most painful things that we experience is when people hurt people. It's even more painful when a believer hearts they believe. That is even worse. The unbeliever can call me foolish. The unbeliever can call me all sorts of things. When a believer calls me that, that is even more painful. 
That is even more painful. Why is there, would there be a call to invest in people when people are people? That is a very tough call. That is a very tough call. I told Daniel, Pastor Joshua's brother, for the few days I've been here, I think it will be very hard to do ministry here for me. Because I have so much to learn about your culture. I mean, you have all sorts of laws and rules. And you, you can't share the gospel with anyone unless you are sued. I mean, someone can actually sue you for sharing the gospel with them. Like, you go to Walmart, everyone is focused on what they're looking for. You go to check out, it's a machine talking to you, asking you to put your card, put your pin, here is a receipt, here is your change. There is no one, okay, there are other tools that have people, but the systems have removed people from people. And maybe in the summer you get to some people, but in the winter, don't get into your car, in your garage. You reverse out to work. Get into your office out back into your house. It's people are not anywhere. We saw out of three people we've seen on the streets, crossing the streets, two were here in Warsaw. I was telling you when we were coming. We saw two young people crossing like Africans. <laughs> yes, buddy. <laughs> yes, that's what's up. That's how you cross the road. Yeah. We're cheering for them. I mean, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but there are no people on the road. Okay, maybe somewhere else there are people in New York City, people are over the streets, but it will be so hard. You have to really get out of your way to minister to people. You really have to. You really have to. Now, when you come to Rwanda, by the fact that you're white, you've like taken care of 50% of your eyes breaking. I'm serious. 50% of your eyes broken. Your eyes have really been broken by the fact that you've appeared like this. I have pictures, I wish I could find them quickly. Finally visited, they just came out of the office, out of life, stood outside like this to see where, and children are leaving school, and the kids just came. Hi, hi, how are you? We are fine. And very shortly, the dad got a translator and said, share with the gospel using the wordless book. You're not green, black, yellow, and gold, and red, to children. Sharing the gospel immediately, just because, I mean, we were there the whole time, no one stopped. No one stopped. No one stopped. The fact that you're white, you're there, that's already ministry. Uganda is also the most, roughly, I think, the most welcoming country. From the airport, hello, you're welcome. Everyone is smiling and you're welcome. You are really <coughs> welcome. And everyone will greet you. They'll say, by Muzum, Muzum means you're white. Okay, don't take it personally. <laughs> they will wave at you, they will. It's not so here. I was hoping to say, hey, hi, hi, man. I mean, you call me black, it may be an issue, isn't it? Racist, you call me black, there you call me Muzum. Okay, <laughs> it's not a law. But at the end of the day, it is hard. You really have to get out of your way. Because like, everything is surrounding you. All the restrictions. What someone will think about you when you share the gospel. It, it is hard. But we have to do it. We have to do it. We have to. We cannot share with the university. We have to. Each one of us sitting here. I know even your petrol station, there's a card that you put, you serve yourself here. Yeah, at home we are served fuel. You park, someone say, how much would you like in your time? You don't even have to leave your car. By the time you're done, you're sharing the gospel track with that person. And if you keep fueling your car from the same petrol station, most likely you find the same person for the month. And by the fact that you fuel from there, you'll be able to share the gospel with that person. I don't know, but I know you know someone who does not know the gospel. Either the guy who mows your grass now you mow your own grass. I've seen people mowing and they're sitting down. Who is the slasher back home? <laughs> <laughs> but there should be someone you know. Is that true? Do you know someone who does not know Christ? Who will be able to give you five minutes? Share the gospel with them. Share the gospel with them. Invest in people. Invest in people. Because people are important. <coughs> what we have in Christ has been considered unfading according to first place. Undefined. There is. In 
fact, was an inheritance that is imperishable. And in verse 6, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember the anchor point? It's all for his glory at the end. It's all for his glory. But the rejoicing that is being described here for what you have in God, though you are suffering and in pain, people hurting people, he's simply saying, this is for a little while. It is temporal. It is not permanent. It is not. It is temporal. But the thing is this, whether success or suffering, we focus on those things, we will lose the main thing. We will lose the main thing. It may be prosperity. It may be suffering. Even for me, we will lose the main thing. Each one of us has a point where we battle this hard. I there's no doubt about that. But we can't focus on that. I remember a day. Someone told me every minister gets to a point where they have to decide whether they're going to stay in ministry or quit. That day comes. They are one single day. There's a day where you're calling to ministry, okay? And you're rejoicing, and the challenges will come, you pray, God will take you through them. But there's a particular day that will come in your life where you will decide and say, This is either or. And that day came for me once. Has been class. There's a program I enroll where we take off 10 days <coughs> after six months and we do class from 7 in the morning to 10 p.m. All the exams, everything is done within those 10 days for the whole semester. We do the semester in 10 days. It's intense. I barely see my family in those days. Go home, they're sleeping, leave when they're sleeping. But this particular one, I'm in the middle of the course, and if you miss it, you wait five years to catch up. Because the class is not repeated. It's taught by a real professor, standing. it's not online or anything. You miss it, you wait five years to catch up that class. I go home and faith, our little child, has extreme diarrhea. Her stomach is messed completely. She has very high fevers. High. But we put the thermometer and you wonder what you're still doing in the house. That kind of thing. We had no paracetamol in the house. Checked, it wasn't there. The liquid thing, the give it is, the high temperature. I had the equivalent of one and a half dollars in my pocket. Account balance. Account balance. It is not cash balance. It is account balance. balance. Sat in the sitting room. And I remember praying. The day before, we had just looked at washing, total washing. And someone just gave an exam. It's, it, I, I never should say total washing is like surrendering on the ground with your hands spread out. You say, God, I don't even deserve to stand before you to sit or anything. It's just me, nothing. And I remember doing that. I remember praying and saying, God, say, God, you called me into ministry. <coughs> And I understood the call. But you never called this little girl. She was only born to our family. Please don't take her away. Please don't take her away. That was hard. I know the skill I have with IT. I know how much I can make with IT. I've chosen to put it aside and serve God full time. And I'm asking God, God, don't take her away from me. I Definitely I was foolish in the right, used my money, even the two that you gave me. Not say you need. At this point I don't have it. But please don't take out. At that point, my phone beeps and a friend who is in America, thousands of miles, asks me on WhatsApp with some app messaging out. Say, David, how can I pray for you today? Oh. 
all this. I don't know how you pour out your heart texting, but I did. I did. The guy told me, all right, I'm going to pray for you, my wife and I have prayed for you. Do you have Panadol? Panadol is like paracetamol, the tablet, in the house somewhere, they are looking for the legal. I got that, Googled on the internet, find out the grammar they need to give up, not for another, but for a child. Broke it, I remember that was, that's what my mom used to do. Broke the thing on the spoon, I added water, it was bitter. I looked at the face and this is bitter, but you have to. And I gave her a spoon of that bitter thing and she swallowed it. Temperature came down. But I remember at that point, just when I almost lost my ministry, someone was there. Someone was there. And all they asked, how can I pray? That guy is a good friend. Very good friend. I pray with his son. His name is Dave Nighting. Good friend. Good friend. He's like a grandpa. Good friend. He's worked with us for a long time now. He's been coming here. Even driving here, he's been part of every step. I'm afraid I have. His name is Thomas Bowling. He came to Uganda as a missionary from Kenya to start World of Life in Uganda. And I attended the first World of Life youth camp. And at the campfire, I remember praying and saying, God, all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever hope to be, now and forever they became the Lord Jesus Christ of Jesus and Lord. Now and forever. We left that camp that time, I was just finishing high school, just before I joined university. I was part of the church at home. And we used to borrow World of Life games equipment, use them during our youth meeting and take them back. One day I'm returning the game equipment, I meet him at the compound at World of Life, that is a small house that I rent in them. And I told him, I want to be a camp counselor, will you teach me? He says, well, come back tomorrow, I'll teach you. He came back, he showed me a store full of dirty stuff, chairs, dusty. And he says, I'd like you to get everything out of the store, clean the store, and put everything back. When I'm done with what I'm doing at the office, I'm going to come and join you. I said, what? The director can leave what he's doing to join me at the store? I'll do whatever he asked me to do. I clean up the store. Put it and say, I'm done. He said, well, Come back to me. I'll teach you the same thing. Concerning the ministry and how to become counselor. And we began a discipleship relationship with him. He's like with my father. One particular thing that I remember very clearly was when that painting, he's taking me back home. And he had to stop halfway the journey and touch this pocket and gave me five thousand, five thousand like two dollars. He gave me that money to use the rest of the way. And he said, here you go, son. With his words, he's giving me that one more. It's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that he called me son. I knew very clearly I lost my dad. And I never heard that word. Someone called me son. I have never, since someone is calling me son, say, here you go, son. A stranger from Kenya who I've never seen. I have uncles, I have other people in my life, brothers, no one had ever told me that. And I knew for sure I meant something more than just someone who was painting me. He invested everything. Like Paul says, not just the gospel, but our lives, I saw that. Everything, everything. I'm a father today. I would have never known how to be a father. I would have never known how to be a father. Everything I know I learned from him. From rebuking his children to loving them. I lived with him, lived at the back of his house. It was a small room where I lived for a couple of years. And the wife used to cook food in the house. And I would come, eat them, 